Uh, for those that don't know us, um, we're the lead regulator in Alberta. Uh, our name may change next June, uh, but our job is still the same, to protect the environment, protect the people of this province. We've had a long tradition of working with Alberta environment and sustainable resource development, and that will continue, perhaps in a different way, but uh, the task is the same. Um, one of the things I just want to highlight with this slide is our continued success uh, over the past 75 years. And the reason that we believe we can be successful in the future is in part because of our strong field presence. We have nine area offices, those that are frontline troops, the ones that often talk to you, whether it's in this setting or at your kitchen table. We also are a science-based, risk-based organization. And a strong example of that is the Bird Geological Survey. They lead the earth science studies in this province, whether that's groundwater mapping or geohazards. And one geohazard that is of interest to the public is micro seismicity. The media often calls these things mini earthquakes. So what's changing? Kevin, from an industry perspective, highlighted for you today that uh, the uh, conventional resources are depleting in this province. Industry is very good at adopting, adapting, and developing new technology, such as multi-stage fracking in horizontal wells, to go after lower quality resources, tight formations, whether it's tight sands, tight carbonates, or tight shales. One of the key drivers at the bottom of this table I wanted to highlight. For you, it's probably going to be self-evident. There's an increased landowner community <laughs> concern about the environment that affects on their uh, life and their families. The expectation of the public has certainly grown over the last uh, yet a while to have open, transparent, and directly accessible data so they can help them uh, decide whether or not we're doing a good job. And of course, desire to participate. And Tracy's just highlighted one area or one example in that. Alberta Context, we've been fracking wells in this province for a long time. We've been drilling horizontal wells for a long time. Uh, since 2008, when things started to take off, we now have in this province over 5,000 horizontal wells with multi-stage fracking. As Kevin said, uh, there's a range of uh, techniques being applied with a very much a range of potential for impacts. Um, just wanted to highlight, and I'll give you a bit more information later, the water use is very dependent on rock characteristics, characteristics properties, and other factors. So when you see a, a large number, be careful that the units may not be right, and also they may not be indicative of every horizontal well in this province. Um, this map, um, the uh, green and yellow, uh, indicates uh, oil and gas wells. Uh, we are tracking activity in this province, learning from this activity. Uh, there's obviously a trend along the foothills. Um, that's where a lot of tight um, sands is, but also some of the uh, early indications of uh, prospective uh, tight shale. But I wanted to highlight in this because it may not be evident, but quite frankly, there are dots, and some of those dots are pattern locations for multiple wells across this province. So we are testing different rocks in different locations across this province, across the different watersheds in this province. Another uh, variation of the same map is this is broken down by formation. Industry is targeting this new technology, testing new techniques in 15 different formations, 15 different rock types, and even within rock types, say like the Duvernay Shale, there can be considerable contrast between sub-regions of that rock uh, or that formation. As Kevin also indicated, there's a wide range of, uh, say, water use, which is a key crit critical factor uh, from the public questions. Um, the uh, cardium uh, trend, uh, tide oil, by the way, represents 30% of the horizontal wells in this province to date. Uh, their water use could extend from 1,000 meters of water per well, not by stage, but for the entire well, to approximately 5,000. As you go up to Fox Creek for the tight Duvernay, very brittle shale, that number jumps to 30,000 to 50,000. 
In the same area of Fox Creek, the Motney, which is sort of a siltstone, not a shale, that water use could be cut in half. You come down towards Rocky Mountain House and Duvernay, they might use 20%. Still large volumes of water. Steve will get into the regulatory process that we have to make sure industry looks for alternatives, minimize the use of fresh water. Um, while industry is, is doing a lot of different uh, science, different techniques, um, I think it's safe to say that you can group the challenges facing the regulator, facing the public in these four areas. Water management and protection, containment of hydraulic fracturing in different ways, whether it's containment on the surface, containment in the formation, or containment in those vertical uh, wells, the vertical pathways. Development planning, cumulative effects, uh, the multiple wells, they take longer to drill, there's more noise, more trucks, more lights for an extended period of time. Communication, communicating the facts to Albertans, engaging them. The diagram on the right here is, has been used uh, fairly frequently, trying to make sure that there is some recognition as to where the likely risk come. Uh, you've heard me and others have said in the past, a fracture through the rock two kilometers to the surface through the stratified nature we have geology in this province is extremely unlikely. That was not the case when we were doing CBM a few years ago. Proximity of a few hundred meters definitely is something the board took action immediately or relatively quickly uh, to deal with limiting uh, frac pressures, frac volumes, and in fact stopping or prohibiting fracturing too close to a water well. The, the likely pathways or the risk factors continue to be surface leaks containment. These kind of wells have tremendous increase in the volumes of material that has to be transported, stored, and disposed of. The vertical pathways through existing or new wells continue to be a risk target. Do we have effective cement? Do we have cemented cases? Do we have integrity of that well bore? Surface impacts, um, as Kevin said, uh, these horizontal legs are getting longer and longer. Gives you a lot of flexibility to locate that pad considering other land uses. However, we have to realize that when you concentrate that impact, instead of having vertical wells everywhere, concentrate it, we have to take a lot of extra care to locate properly that, that pad site. That's going to be a, a site that's going to have a lot of, let's call it construction noise, construction activity for an extended period of time. CBM wells, we could drill them, start to finish in three days. These wells, a single well may take 30 days, 45 days to drill, two weeks of fracturing. The next well, the next well. Likewise, some existing single well sites are not suitable for pads. Re-engage the landowners and the neighbors. Do not just add a horizontal well to the existing site. It may be okay, but may not be. We have to have industry and the public and the regulator re-ask the question. We have a fairly strong regulatory framework in this province. Um, there's a lot of rules and regulations. Um, as the resource changes in this province, the ERC believes the regulator and the regulatory process can and should also change with it. So while we have a lot of rules and regulations with your input, uh, energy's input, internal input, we are investigating whether or not we need to change, modify, alter many of these regulations that we've had in place for many years. Responding to change. Today I just wanted to touch on four critical areas. The expanding information base with direct public access, updating a few examples of requirements, share with you a new play-based planning approach that we hope to take, and examples of the need and the importance of stakeholder engagement, enhancements to that, supporting best practices. Baseline information. Public access to information directly is not something new. Uh, almost 10 years ago, we introduced the Integrated Application Registry. Today, if you see a, an activity uh, that's regulated down the road, you can either phone our field staff uh, or 
phone the company, or they can go right down to the ERCB website, go into applications, view applications, and then that, whether or not you know the location, the company name, the application number, you can search by area, you can find not only the application, but that we've been maybe received yesterday, so it's 24 hour live, you can also access the application documentation. We are expanding that in Directive 59, which is our process to gather, capture, disseminate well drilling and completion information. We are going to ensure uh, compliance with the submission of frac fluid chemicals um, and we're taking the next step, full disclosure. We're taking this opportunity because of internal needs for water management and public questions to have a major enhancement of the knowledge captured on water use. And that's water use for every well fracture in this province, whether it's vertical or horizontal. With the help of our bird environment, we've got 11 classes or categorization of water use that will be captured and tracked and available to you. The public access to this information will be frackfocus.ca. BC has had this thing live since uh, January of this year. Uh, we're committed to having the machinery in place that industry can start to populate their wells by the end of this year. So come January 1st, Kevin, the rest of industry will be required to submit data, and this is going to be after the drill, and within 30 days, that's our rules, all this detailed information. Just back, backing up a minute, Tracy also had a good idea. When you're consulting with the, the landowners and the neighbors, if they have an interest in frac chemicals, etc., we're not saying don't talk to them for 30 days after you finish. Talk to them <coughs> early. But from a record keeping and direct access by the public, our processes will be, the information will be filed in detail and available to you through a computer system 30 days after the well is completed. That will populate a very much a growing database in this province. Likewise, unconventional resource mapping. Uh, I hope by the end of next week you will see some AGS maps, large regional scale maps on shale which gives you a lot of perspective as a watershed planning group that could be very interested in the state of your watershed, for example. We also are expanding uh, saline water mapping so that if industry wants to get alternative water, there'd be a more extensive database for them. Non-saline groundwater mapping, the Calgary Edmonton uh, Groundwater Atlas is a prime example of that. Um, we're going to have more performance measure reports than we have in the past. That's our commitment to you. And the bottom line here, too, is increased capacity through AGS to monitor and report on the potential for induced seismicity, those many earthquakes. And I, I welcome questions if you want in that area. A um, couple examples of uh, updating changes um, with a large volume increase in material that has to be stored on site. Uh, last year, we went through a, a science environmental uh, review of uh, some large volume containment vessels that have not traditionally been used in this past, in this province. We have a lot of rules and regulations on line pits, uh, storage tanks, stakes, etc. We had to respond to this new activity to making sure that the new equipment industry wanted to use is technically environmentally sound. Uh, uh, updating fracturing controls. As I referenced before, uh, industry, multi-stakeholder approach, uh, we set controls in 2006 for shallow fracking in close proximity to groundwater. It was updated again in 2009. Uh, we recognize interwell communication. Uh, we've had a few unfortunate accidents in this province. We want to minimize that from reoccurring. Uh, we have a bulletin out the first of this year its focus was, in part, assessing the risk of wells around you, incorporating that information in planning your fracturing uh, program. Perhaps you have to back away from that offset well, should it be judged to be high risk. Likewise, as Tracy said, if you're drilling two kilometers, 
you might actually not have stages four, five, and six in close proximity of that offset well. There's different ways of mitigating that risk. You might actually go in there and uh, recomplete the offset well. There's many ways that could happen. Likewise, um, new proposals that are currently under study, uh, continuous improvement of well bore integrity, mandatory notification to the ERCB field staff of fracturing uh, commencement. Uh, many companies do that voluntarily. We're going to make it mandatory. Our field staff would have better opportunities to go and do a, a site visit. Um, and as I said before, expanding risk review and mitigated plans for those offset wells. Mo a lot more detail will be coming shortly. Now, those are things that we have done. A lot of that is traditional ways. Having a new mandatory requirement, very prescriptive, uh, doing etc. But we at the RCB also believe we have to study maybe a new approach, a new way of doing business. And one way of that is to stand back and say the nature of this resource is airily extensive uh, resource requiring multiple wells. Sure, they're located in a pad, but we're going to have multiple pads. Extended uh, construction noise, etc. a lot more trucks. What we want to do here is to declare a play, and a play would be a, a geological definition, a regional definition of activity, uh, and have earlier planning, uh, organized risk by that play. So some of our technical rules could vary for that play-specific area. We want to be sensitive to those local needs and the local risk factors that are being present. Uh, we want to shift the ERCB from a focus traditionally on proximity wells to more of a regional view because those are the regional impacts that I think you're going to have questions about. Early planning, increased collaboration among companies, expanded information to the public, to different groups, enhanced engagement. All part of, I think, a more effective response um, than just changing one rule here, one rule there. We're trying to integrate the solutions, if you will. A couple examples. Um, we anticipate to issue a pad approval, not a single well approval. The uh, requirements for a pad approval very well could be an expanded dialogue notification to the public. So it's not just 200 meters to the residents, but what makes sense for that type of development. Almost a local plan. Not just respond to operational problems after the well has started, but ask the question with that local public immediately around the pad, what are your issues around roads? Do we need to have dust control? Have that question and discussion early with the county, of course, not just halfway through the operation. Um, what about noise? What about lights? What can you do to mitigate or reduce those impacts? Uh, project planned by a company. You've heard Tracy talk about going to the county, for example, or local synergy groups with their drilling plans for this coming year. The county, for example, could take those plans and say, we observe one thing. Three companies are seeking to use the same road at the same time. Industry, the county will ask that question with that information base. The company is going to have to collaborate on a solution. They're going to have to coordinate some of their activities. And once again, on a play scale uh, development plan, we're looking for a group of companies to address things like, say, water use, water recycling on a play scale. Finding regulatory um, uh, regional solutions that possibly will exceed the capacity of a single operator a group of operators can do more. So what should the plans include? Uh, water, water management plans, surface infrastructure planning, subsurface reservoir management, if you will, stakeholder engagement, life cycle integrity uh, questions up front, not down the road. And for this group especially, the plan should show or demonstrate how it fits with those overarching land use plans and watershed plans. Planning in this province at a higher level and a regional scale is emerging in this province. We want to make sure the oil and gas development plans are going to fit. 
best practices. There's a lot of organizations where there's CAT, uh, SPOG, etc., looking at how to complement or bring that local or sub-regional need to the forefront. Uh, many companies are responding to either the regulatory direction or especially the community direction and doing more. They're reviewing those local risk factors and it, we have many examples of companies exceeding the board's minimum. The board often regulates, in certain cases, a minimum distance. We do not regulate a maximum. We encourage that. Um, one example that I thought was extremely uh, uh, good and, and hopefully an example to others, uh, there's a company uh, came to my attention that they're engaging all the parties along the truck route. So not 1.5 circles. Circles are possibly part of the problem when you start drawing a circle. Step outside the circle, what's the expectation? Thinking about how a company could impact a community. So when you have a circle, whether it's 200 meters or 1.5, don't forget, there's a large number of trucks coming up and down the road system that have been coordinating with the county. Who's talking to those people down the road? Uh, I thought that was a very progressive and a good example to others. Companies are coordinating operations, uh, sourcing of water wells, uh, of water sources. Um, we have some very good early examples of that. We hope to expand on it. Stakeholder engagement, I just wanted to leave this. Uh, communicating Alberta facts to Albertans is, is one of the things that I believe in strongly, and I believe that you are expecting that of the regulator. Access through the ERSB websites, Alberta Environment's website, SPOG's website are all good. Uh, searching the website for problems worldwide, I, I accept that and I respect that. When you go worldwide, I encourage you to uh, look at a range of sources, not just one. When you see sites that are raising either a big negative or just as important, a big positive, go back to that site two weeks, two months later to see if that it continues to be their position. Because you need information to raise your own thoughts, to come to your own conclusions, your own positions as to whether or not the regulations are working, industry is responding to your needs, the regulatory needs, um, etc. Uh, synergy groups, uh, outreach groups, uh, watershed groups are all good ideas. We hope to see more of that in Alberta and become more effective in contributing to the solutions. And I thank you. Look forward to your questions later.